unpaid call from? Right. An inmate at the Virginia Department of Corrections, Red Onion State Prison. To accept this call, press zero. This is Red Onion Randy, and thank you for listening to my podcast. I left you all in this part of the story when I was reading the Wheel of Time series, and I heard that still small voice inside me of God just telling me the only difference between me and land were the choices that we made. And that voice, that that observation of choices was my epiphany moment. That's the moment where everything in my life completely changed. You know, and I had dabbled in Christianity. Um you know, years before that, and off and on, I, you know, backslid a couple times. You know, I studied different denominations, different sects. I'd studied uh, a little bit of Judaism. I'd studied a little bit of uh, Buddhism. Um, I'd even, you know, glanced at Islam a little bit, but I realized pretty quickly that that wasn't for me. That epiphany, that, you know... Nothing really exciting happened as far as violence goes. Um, I'd had a few, you know, uh, a few moments of anger here and there. Uh, But, you know, I mean, I'm in solitary confinement. I'm in a cell, and I've gotten past the point of having the COs come run in the door and beat the hell out of me. You know, while they're, you know, 20 or 30 deep wearing full ride gear and I'm just by myself. So I never really done anything after that. I just, I focused on me. And that was a very, it was the most difficult period in my life. Is looking in that mirror. And allowing yourself to see yourself for who and what you truly are. And I wanted to run from it. I wanted to run from it. But I couldn't. Something in, there's something in me. I don't have no backup or give in me. And that's another reason why I've been so violent in my life is, you know, if somebody challenges me, okay, let's see what you're made of. Either I'm going to whoop your ass or you're going to whoop my ass. That's my motto in life. I'm a fighter. That's what I do. That's what I'm good at. And it's just about the only thing I am good at, unfortunately. And that is sad to say. But I have no backup or give in me. And that includes myself. So in essence, I had to whoop my own ass just so I could get out of my own way. And I saw myself for a liar. I saw myself for a loser. I saw myself for someone who deceives, someone who will steal and take something that doesn't belong to him, something he didn't work for. I looked and saw myself for a murderer. Life meant nothing to me. My own life meant nothing to me. Before that time, I didn't care whether I lived or died. I didn't care whether you lived or died. That might frighten some people. And quite frankly, it should. It frightened me once I realized it. Once I realized the depth of how far I'd fallen. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very hard thing to realize about yourself. You know, to realize that, hey, you are the person you think you are. You're not the person you presume yourself to be. And I was so far from what I thought myself to be, it was ridiculous. I blamed everybody else. It was the world's fault. It wasn't me. I wasn't the one in the wrong. I I was a martyr. I was the victim. Forget about the people I shot and murdered. I mean, forget about the people I fought and hurt and sent to medical and the throats I split in and the people that I robbed and stole from them and broke into their house and violated their sanctuary and their home and their peace of mind, you know, forget about all that. I was the victim. And those were the times where I was I was closer to committing suicide 
than I ever was at any other time in my life. No matter how tough things got for me, you know, I had hope in me. But when I was seeing who and what I truly was during those years, and believe me when I tell you this, it takes years. If you think you're going to do introspection for a couple of days or weeks, yeah, you're lying to yourself and you might as well go do something else because you're going to fail and you're going to fail spectacularly and miserably. It takes years. And you have to be willing to put that work in. And thank God I was. Thank God I'm a stubborn son of a bitch. Because if I wasn't stubborn, if I wasn't willing to fight anyone and anything at the drop of a hat, and I will buy the hat and drop it for you, I would have failed, and I would have killed myself, or I would have went back to lying and deceiving myself, and I would have been so much worse than I ever was. But I just, I kept at it. I never gave up. And... When I saw all the negative things in my life, I started speaking positive things in my life. I would stand in front of the mirror, and I would just tell myself, you can do this. You can overcome this. You can change. You can rehabilitate yourself. You don't need the state of Virginia to do it. You don't need the Department of Corrections to do it. You can do it if you want to do it, and you will do it because I believe in you. I had faith in you. And I kept telling myself I had faith in myself, that I had belief in myself. You know, I kept praying to God. I, I kept reading and studying, and I kept fantasizing and daydreaming and creating stories and different worlds and characters and, you know, brand new magical items and weapons. And I've created my own uh, brand new weapons. I've created my own fighting style in my head. I have practiced it somewhat, you know, the actual moves, but I'm dealing with uh, some pretty severe medical issues, tumors and holes uh, eaten in my lower right tibia. So, I, you know, I can only do but so much exercise now. And doing all of these mental things and speaking all of these positive things, and I would read these stories. And I would look at these characters, and I would use these characters to motivate myself to overcome. You know, I would use the struggles that they have throughout the book and throughout the series and the story and the plot. And I'm like, okay, if they can do this, and I would allow myself to get so attached to these characters that they would become real. And that's what happens with the Wheel of Time series and Robert Jordan. They're, they're, they're not characters, they're friends. And some of them are enemies, because some of them I really wanted to slap the living hell out of. But I allowed them to become real to me, and I allowed them to inspire me. And they did. And I changed. And, you know, this took several years. So I wound up staying at SEG for a year, and then I get released into intensive management program, which was segregation. It was still solitary confinement, but you got a few more privileges. Um, like you got to come out and have a job rolling sports chained to the floor and the table at the front of the pod. Um, and you got to order a little bit more commissary and you got television all week long instead of just on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You know, stuff of that nature. And that's when I was on the documentary Solitary a Look Inside Reckoning State Prison. And I don't know why. Uh, I just chalk it up to God made them choose me, but they chose me. They came to me. They basically didn't give me a choice, you know, because when the lieutenant came to the door and he said, hey, you're going to be on the documentary tomorrow. I'm like, man, what documentary? So he explained what was going on. I'm like, man, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. He said, well, yeah, you're going to do it regardless, so you're doing it. And I was, All right, man, I don't feel like arguing with you. And that's how I got on the documentary. I really didn't want to be on there originally. I'm so glad he made me because doing that documentary has completely changed my life, and it has allowed me to meet some incredibly amazing people around the world. 
and it's allowing me this opportunity to talk to you right now. For you to get to know me and to hopefully learn from me simply by not doing the things I used to do. That's my that's my goal with this podcast is to keep you from coming in here, keep you from throwing and pissing your life away the way I did mine. So I do the documentary, and you know, and I I keep working on myself. I I keep striving to be better. That's every every day I wake up and I strive to be better than I was the day before. I strive to be a little bit less angry. I strive to be a little bit more in control of my thoughts and my emotions. I strive to be more positive. I strive to look for the best in situations. I strive not to let things get to me that normally would have me kicking on the doors and ready to fight and battle the COs. So now I just, I don't do that because it's not worth it because I want to make better choices. 2019, I get released from solitary confinement after 13 and a half years. Um, And how that came to be is since the documentary came out, a lot of things have changed in the state of Virginia Department of Corrections. Uh, They no longer use long-term solitary confinement thanks to that documentary. now it, it's it's a lot easier for guys to get released. Uh, the Department of Corrections seems like they're a little bit more willing to work with a person and to try to talk with a person than they are just throwing you in a cell and leaving you there year after year after year in the hell with you. Um, so Warden Jeffrey Kaiser, uh, him and... Unit manager Walter Sweeney was making rounds one day, and uh, they stopped and they knocked on the window of the cell and called me to the door. So I come to the door, and uh, you know I ask them how they doing, blah blah blah. We 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 chat a little bit, and then they ask me, "Are you interested in getting released uh, from solitary?" And I was like, "Yeah, I am." However, I'm not trying to go to a straight up general population pop because. Y'all have kept me in solitary confinement for 13 and a half years by myself. If you just take me out there and put me straight into a cell with another human being, there's going to be blood on the floor. I I can't help myself. I mean, I'm so used to being by myself. If he does something or says something, I feel uncomfortable. And because I'm in the cell with him, I'm not going to go to sleep with him in there. If, If we ever have words... One of us is leaving that cell because I don't trust you. So that's why, you know, I tell, you know, Warden Kaiser and Walter Sweeney and them that, hey, look, yo, I I can't go out there and just get in the cell with a dude right away. I'm not programmed for this. You know, there will be blood on the floor, man. I can't do this. So they they asked me, well, would you be interested in going to the Sam Sip pod? You have one minute remaining. This has been Red Onion Randy. I hope you enjoy listening to me. Please check out my website, redonionrandy.com. And if you can, if you have the time, I would appreciate you giving me a rating, hopefully five stars, but I'll take whatever you can give me. Take care and stay safe. Thank you for using GTL.